Hi, I'm Randy Simmons for Ion Arts, and I've got a special show for you guys today. We were standing here in front of Leaping Trout Studios in Lower Town, uh, Paducah, Kentucky, and uh, we have a demonstration that's going to be uh, given to us today by Keith Cars. Uh, let's go in, and uh, I think Keith's uh, waiting for us. Keith, you've already done some prep work for this demonstration. Uh, uh, not only you know, getting ready for this watercolor, but you actually moved furniture around so we could uh, get in with the camera crew. That's true. Uh, so t tell us what you've done to prepare <clears throat> for, for this initial uh, uh, watercolor demo. Okay, uh, what I've started with here is an 11 by 15 inch sheet of watercolor paper. It's cold press. Uh, what's the weight on that? 140 pound cold press watercolor paper. What I've done is, a, saturated the paper with water then I had stapled it to this board and as it dries the paper stretches and the staples hold it down on all four sides and it creates a beautifully flat perfectly flat surface. Now you mentioned cold press paper um, you don't use hot press paper? Well I, uh, I prefer cold press and I, I I should, probably shouldn't mention any press because I don't really know the difference between the two. It's a, the way the paper is manufactured. Uh, yeah. Cold press is just typically a little bit bumpier and hot has, press yeah, is It has more of a smooth. tooth to it or more texture. Mm -hmm. And uh, hot press papers, yeah, they're generally smoother. So I like this uh, texture. But in this particular case, I'm using a Strathmore paper. But uh, I like uh, some of the French made watercolor papers. Uh, offhand, I can't remember the name of it. That's what happens when you get over 50 years old. And what about the watercolors? What kind of watercolors are you using? Um, I use a variety of uh, different brands. I use Grumbacher paints and I use Winsor Newton uh, watercolor paints. And I put them around this uh, plastic palette and uh, they, they are dry and I, you know, when I get, get to using them, I, I wet them and re sort of reconstitute them. So it's okay that they dry up yeah. on the palette? Yeah. As I deplete the paint in the reservoir, I just pump some fresh paint in there. So I've got my, my hot colors and my warm colors on the right, and I work those colors. I blend those on the right side of this palette. And I've got my cool colors over to the left and my earth tones, sepias and burnt sienna and raw umber and I work those colors on the left-hand side of this uh, palette. Well, that's it's, interesting. You're working with an organized palette system. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it just it, it helps me um, keep it all together, and I don't mix the two, uh, generally speaking. Now I've got a real funky looking brush out right now, and uh, it's it's been abused because I've dipped it into this uh, liquid masket or masking fluid, and I often use that when I want to preserve uh, highlights in a painting, especially very detailed highlights, and in this particular case. Uh, the sky color, for instance, uh, that's that's appearing through this tree in this landscape, and the camera's moving in closely. Yeah, there we go. Now this is like you said preserves the white area, so you're not going to accidentally paint over. Exactly. Because once uh, you paint uh, over an area, it's uh, yeah, you've sealed your fate. It's a done deal, and. Uh, working transparently, you always, as a watercolor artist, have to think about preserving your highlights, areas that you want them to uh, keep in a lighter color. And rather than cut around these little bitty shapes, I'm using this masking fluid as a, as a helpful aid. Um, I have some highlights in the water surface below, uh, and I'm covering those as well. This particular picture I'm working with, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, the west shore of Kentucky Lake, the mouth of Malcolm Bay, and the scene is an early morning shot with a fog bank on the eastern shore of, the, of Kentucky Lake. So, and I tend to work for my own photography. I mean, I could get real busy with this, and but I, I, I probably limit how much of this I do. So you work from light to dark. Exactly, and uh, for watercolor painting, a 
transparent watercolor painting is, is a matter of uh, layers from light to dark, and it's really a glazing process. Uh, <clears throat> and the darker the color, of course, the more layers of, of paint. I've got a silhouette of a tree on the shoreline here, and that, that is almost black in some areas. I, I don't use black in my palette, but I would mix a lot of the blues, greens, reds, and I mean, I've mixed just about every color but yellow and orange to make a dark uh, shade of, of a very dark tone, almost black. And I wouldn't do it all at once. I might build up that dark shape with uh, repeated layers. Uh, in some instances, I've done uh, dark areas in a painting, and it could be as many as 20 to 30 coats of paint. Wow. So a watercolor this size, about how long do you think it would take <clears throat> to complete this size? Well, uh, it, it, again, it depends upon the uh, simplicity or the complexity of the painting. This painting is fairly straightforward, and it's fairly simple. It's almost a silhouette of a tree and a, and a bank, a shoreline on the lake with a shadow on the water surface. There's, in, in other words, there's not a whole lot of detail. So this would take considerably less time than a portrait or a figure study or uh, you know, a close-up of uh, architectural subject matters or something else. And I, I think I'll just get started. Okay, shall we take a, a quick break and then come right back to this while we let your, um, your masking fluid dry? I think it's dry already. It dries pretty rapid. Yeah, there. Okay, well then uh, we'll just hold off on that. Why don't we just keep going? Man, you weren't kidding when you said it dried fast. Well, I, I, think, it, I think it has. I'm not going to worry about it. And if it hasn't, then I'll sit here and say, well, I was wrong. Now I'm mixing uh, what appears to be uh, phthalo blue and a uh, ultramarine blue to make up my sky color. And this is a very pale blue sky. It's almost washed out. But <clears throat> I'm going to start in the upper left corner and work my way down. And have to work incredibly fast because this is wet on going to be wet on wet. Uh, I'm coming down to the fog bank itself. And this is tricky, very tricky. You, you have to work fast or you get some edges showing up. You have to keep your leading edge wet at all times. I see. So, you, so you're painting into your trees, which I guess is okay because yeah, you're going to paint them dark anyway. Exactly. So uh, my light, my light colors, uh, I can lay those down directly over the top of where that tree will appear, and I don't want. I want this. Let's see. What do I want? I really have to think this through here. Now it's interesting that the, when the paint goes down, it looks incredibly dark, but it'll dry lighter in color. And I, in some cases, I want to lift the color. I just take a, a tissue or some other cl a, a cloth and lift the color out. Interesting, sometimes interesting things occur when the paint starts swimming around and I, I let it just happen, whatever happens. There's the land mass, there's the loose hair, I like that. Uh, generally, I do a very detailed pencil drawing. In this particular case, it's fairly simple and I did it all freehand. Sometimes I'll grid the picture and draw a grid on the paper uh, to get my proportions. Uh, accurate. <clears throat> now, um, the cloud bank, or the, should we keep going? Fog bank uh, is, has more gray in it, so I'm going to introduce some uh, earth tones and start in on that side. Okay, is it time for a break? Oh, too late now, I got the gray going. You want me to break? After this. Okay. I'll just work, I'm just going to work this across. The magic begins. 
There's another loose hair gone, dang it. Man, who's losing well, all their hair? Well. Is that your brush or is that out of your head? <laughs> Keith's going to be bald when this is over with. Yeah, I am indeed. That's right. There we go. Trying to create a soft edge here. And I saw it lift some. Well, I'm happy. I guess I'm going to be okay with that. Okay, let's uh, let's let's take a quick break, <clears throat> and we're going to come right back to this. This is a very uh, challenging painting, and that there's there's a lot of wet on wet technique, a lot of diffused edges, and over the water, the horizon line, there is a tremendous amount of warm yellow, uh, kind of a yellowish gold, and I want to lay that down because. Uh, well, for one, it's there, but uh, get get that indicated. And like I said, I'm working light to dark, so I'm working a lot of light colors. And just uh, sort of wash the whole foreground with that. Now, during our break, <clears throat> you took the hair dryer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you dried all the, the pigments so far on the paper. Yeah, usually uh, I have enough time that I don't need to use the hair dryer, but to speed th speed up the drying process, it's a useful tool. And uh, just about every watercolor artist I've uh, taken lessons from or seen actually painting uh, employs the use of a hair dryer, especially when teaching or uh, conducting a demonstration such as this. Do you do a lot of workshops, classes? I've, I've done a few. Uh, I've taught out at the college uh, evening courses, adult education evening classes, as a matter of fact, uh, for continuing education for adults. And I'm, I've done a couple workshops in the area. I get folks come up to me and say, uh, Would, could you do some teaching? Uh, and I said, sure. Uh, it's an opportunity that presents itself once in a while. I, I don't bill myself necessarily as a teacher, but I, I can do that. There. Well, that looks really good. You've really warmed those, those values up. Mm hmm Now, I want to lift some color out of here, so I'll dry, take a dry brush through there and lift some of that wet wetness out of there, kind of. I think I like that. We'll stick with that. Wonderful. Okay, I think we're ready for another break and we'll get the hair dryer out and get this dried and uh, move on to the next stage. Okay, during our uh, break, our brief break there, I added some more pigment, more color to the sky and the cloud bank or fog bank. Um, wh where I'm going now is into the foreground surface of the water. It's kind of a blue-gray and it's what I consider a mid-tone, so I'm going to work, work up that area. Let's see. That color. What do I got? I need a little raw umber in there. Wow. Smashing. <clears throat> Your palette looks pretty cool. So, there's a lot of diagonal motion in this water. And I don't want to get too heavy-handed. I'm working uh, horizontally, side to side. A flat brush would be good for this, too. But that one's too big, isn't it? No, I, matter of fact, I'd probably use the one I... Why not? Let's get in there. Let's really put some paint down in a hurry here. There. And I'm just going to coat this whole area. Why not carry it over there? Get, get over there, will you? And let's see, we got a lot of ripple action here. We can use a flat brush. 
in this manner. And of course, like anything, the farther back on the surface of the water, the smaller the ripples. Let's just get ripple crazy here. Now there are some wide areas that I would, I might use my <coughs> masket material to mask those out, but we're going to cut around those. Can you tell us a little bit about what got you into watercolors? Well, uh, actually it was a friend of the family, a very eccentric gentleman. Uh, Herman Werner was his name. And he introduced me to an art teacher by the name of Ralph Baker. And Herman spoke to my parents and said, you know, your son's very talented. You ought to enroll him in one of Ralph Baker's watercolor classes, which they did. And they laid a lot of cash out initially for materials to get me started. And Ralph Baker was a retired gentleman who lived in the, <coughs> lived in the gold country in Northern California. And he painted a lot of old uh, barns with corrugated metal roofs, and I, for, to this day I still call them Ralph Shacks, because uh, Ralph Baker was good at that, painting those dilapidated buildings. But anyway, it was an evening course for adults, and I was 17 years of age uh, in a class with mostly senior citizens, and they enjoyed having me in the class, kind of pumped a little life into that old stodgy group. And uh, Anyway. Uh, they were glad to have me, and I was uh, thrilled to be a part of that class. So Ralph Baker is the first teacher I ever took in watercolor painting, and that uh, I discovered. I just did the math. That was 37 years ago, and I've been painting in watercolors ever since. Wow, 37 years. Yes. Gave you tell a lot of your, your age. Yeah, a lot of your viewing audience um, <coughs> wouldn't know it. I haven't even been around that long. Hardly. See, 37 years makes you 104. <laughs> yeah, I've been painting a long time before brushes were invented. What'd yeah. you paint with? Paint with my hair. <laughs> yeah, human hair. That's why I got a ball spot over here. Okay, I'm going to let this dry. Now's a good time to break. Well, as I, as I explained earlier, the foliage, the tree, the bank on the lake, and the, the uh, reflection on the surface will be the last uh, layers I'm going to apply to the paper. Um, it's, it's a long and tedious process, as you can see, and I, of course I won't get it, this piece finished during this program, but um, it's a matter again of laying, up, laying your colors down from light to dark, and I'm going to continue working detail onto the water surface, the lake surface, uh, to getting it to a point that I'm satisfied with. And then uh, the final part of this process will be laying down the darks uh, that you see in the foreground and the right edge of this painting. One thing I noticed too is that you're also working from background to foreground, which <coughs> actually goes hand to hand with working light to dark. Yeah, it, 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 uh, I am as a matter of fact. It, that's not always the case, but uh, I do tend to work from the upper portion of the painting uh, from top to bottom and left to right uh, as a matter of th a rule of thumb. Uh, boy, that's an intense blue there. Too blue. Yeah. If you put down the wrong color, can you can you take it back off with a yeah, paper if you, towel? Or while something? it's still wet, you can lift color. Uh, fairly easily, and or dilute <coughs> dilute your paint, uh, your pigment with more water. I'm trying to get this sort of overall shape of this blue running running through this uh, center area here. Not sure if I'm succeeding, but. So how many works do you produce uh, in a year's time? Well, uh, not as many as I would like to. I, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline to, to, to keep at it. And, and uh, 
you know, work daily. There are some periods of time where I don't touch a brush for a week or more. And then I go in spurts. Uh, sometimes um, I, I, you know, I paint for hours on end and I lose track of all time. So it, it really, um, for me, it's, I don't, you know, schedule six hours a day at the easel or it just, I wait for the muse to strike me, but that, as a business person, that um, isn't the best way to work. Again, it takes a lot of discipline, and it takes direction and uh, figuring out what you want to paint and how you want to grow as an artist. But I'm getting philosophical here. So how many hours <clears throat> would it take for you to do a piece this size or, or, or to finish what you're doing now? Well, you know, people often ask me that and I don't know how to answer it really because sometimes I, I've, there have been a couple of instances where I've actually logged my time and I could say, well, that took 40 hours or that took 30 hours. But I would guesstimate to f bring this painting to completion would probably be uh, it would probably take maybe four to six hours time. And I mean there's a good deal of time sp spent allowing the paint to dry, the watercolor paint <coughs> to dry. So, Well that's not even counting the time it take, took you to go take your photographs. Um, right. And if you're you know, digitally manipulating those, that's not even considering so that time. I do, uh, I do record all the trips I take to the lake. And for instance, in this case, uh, I, I log my mileage to this location and the amount of time it took to shoot this uh, series of photographs, that sort of thing. So I, I, in essence, keep track of my time that way. And All right, are we at a stopping point to yeah. let this dry? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll pull out the, the hair dryer and start drying. Yeah. Due to our time constraints with our 30 minute program, of course, I won't get this painting done today. However, uh, I'll make sure that the viewing audience sees the completed painting uh, at the end of the program. I've, I'm still not satisfied with my fog bank here, so I'm going to lay down some clear water. And I'm doing that to, to do a wet-on-wet -wet wash. Uh, in other words, I don't want any hard edges on this shape. Then I'll take take my number seven with my pure camel hair and get that warm gray color going there. That's what I'm looking for. And I'll run it, sort of dab it in there. I'm trying to get this m mist that's hovering over the lake's surface here. So you're letting the pigment to bleed out yeah, because you've got a lot of in, water. Into the wet water. I don't want to mix up my water again. Oh, that works really well for what for the effect that you want. Yes. So and it's real dark over here to the right side. Wow. It's working two handed. Yeah. It, a lot of people don't know it, but I am ambidextrous. I, I have taken drawing classes and painting classes with left-handed because my right hand was in a cast at the time. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for everyone. I just try to stay out of trouble and don't get your hands and our limbs broken. But I was a daredevil as a young man. I was in a cast as a child. We'll get to deal with the time. Okay. I see what you mean by that, that paper, the cold press, um, that texture, that paper is coming through. I see it in the gray, and we talked about it earlier in the blue sky off camera. Yeah, the pigment tends to settle in the, in the divots or the <coughs> pockets in the texture of the paper. I think if I try to do too much more here, I'm just going to lose, lose it. I, I want to get back to that gold color. I like that too. Get a little bit of that on this transition, maybe. It's in there, you know. 
I've seen some of your other watercolors, and <clears throat> you were able to get some of your, especially your reds, so bright. How do you how do you achieve such a an intense bright well, color? Well, again, it's just layer after layer after layer of, of that particular color. But um, reds can be very vibrant. It's and I always do work in layers from light. I mean, I, I'll lay down the the red at fit perhaps a 50 percent value and then i'll keep building and building and building till i get it to the intensity or the saturation that i'm looking for i probably here's a, here's what i want i want to make a more distinct edge on the top of that cloud so i'm going to carry let's go get some, pick up some of this blue do you ever do mixed media pieces uh, very, very rarely. I, I don't do that too often, Randy. Let's see here. Now look at that, it's bled on down. Excuse my reach. I'm going to have to pick some of that up. How are we doing on our time? Okay. So you haven't well, finished in two minutes. Yeah. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, it's, this is a very challenging subject because there's <clears throat> so many diffused areas. There's this whole fog bank is literally is fog. I mean, it, it's wispy and it's misty and it's hovering on the lake surface and <clears throat> it's a very difficult. Um, thing to capture with this medium. So now I'm, I'm taking my tissue here and trying to lift some of that color I just put down. I think that looks pretty good. I'm going to stop at this point. So to finish this up, <coughs> you're looking at obviously a lot more layers in the rest of the work, but we still have to do the um, right. silhouette of I think, the tree uh, and the reflection. And I, I'll build that up from light to dark. I'll start, it'll all be gray perhaps, and then I'll go back over with a more saturated mix of, of color or pigment. And that'll really tie this whole painting together. I'll, I'll have the foliage and the, uh, the lake shore just popping up from the surface of, of the lake and the, the background as well as the shadow in the foreground. And I'm going to darken this immediate surface of the water uh, to, to put some more weight at the bottom of this painting. I think I've got the sky just about where I want it. I might put a little bit darker blue up in that corner. Great. And you'll send us a JPEG of this. That's and, right. And we'll uh, so, insert it at the end of the show. Yes, and absolutely. so our viewing audience will see the, the finished product. Well, Keith, thanks a lot for, for uh, showing us his demonstration today. And, and again, it's good to work with you on our fourth show together. Yes. How Just about like that? old times. Good deal. All right. Well, I believe that concludes our show for today. So thank you guys for watching, and we'll catch you next time on the Eye on Arts.